In recent years, the network has continued to grow through line reopenings and new projects. In 2022, the Elizabeth Line opened, creating a high-frequency east-west rail link through the capital, running from Reading at Heathrow in the west to Shenfield in the east. Across the country, tracks are being doubled, connections are being refined, and all sorts of running systems are being streamlined, making services more frequent and efficient. Many lines are being reopened. One of the most drastic is the east-west rail link currently under construction, which aims to reopen the railway between Oxford and Cambridge by 2030. Not only will it boost communications between the two great universities, it will restore crosslinks to central England, where currently none exists between London and Birmingham. But most prominent in the news is HS2. Buoyed by the success of HS1, the government announced its ambitious project in 2009, designed to provide high-speed connections from London to the cities of the north, boosting the economy of the areas and freeing up space on the existing network for slower stopping services. It could even be linked into HS1 and the West and East Coast main lines, effectively creating a direct service from Edinburgh to Paris. Construction got underway in 2017 for Phase 1, which would run from London to Birmingham. The route would follow viaducts and tunnels for most of its length in order to avoid disruption, and they would be some of the longest ever built for Britain's railways. Biggest of all is the Colne Valley Viaduct, now out of construction. Upon completion, it would be the longest viaduct in Britain, 3.4 kilometres long, with spans about 80 metres, and will weigh 116,000 tonnes. It is built using the same rapid construction techniques employed by high-speed railways in France. More than a thousand bridge sections are manufactured in an on-site factory. Each section is then raised into place with a 100-metre horizontal crane known as a launching girder, which simultaneously holds the previous spans in place until the span is complete. Upon completion, the girder can then be walked onto the next span. However, HS2 quickly ran into problems. Initial estimates put the cost of the project at 37 billion. By 2020, estimations had added more than 100 billion to this figure. To many, it was becoming a money sink when there were so many other infrastructure projects badly in need of funding. To cut costs, the project scope was reduced bit by bit. The link to HS1 was removed in the planning stages in 2014. The leg towards Leeds was cut in 2021. And finally, in 2023, the northern leg was cancelled altogether. Even the link to Euston is now in question, with proposals to halt at Old Oak Common in London's suburbs. Effectively, this leaves a high-speed rail link running only from outer London to Birmingham, two cities which are already pretty well connected by rail. The government promised that the money saved by cancelling Phase 2 will be used to fund infrastructure projects elsewhere. They probably use much of this funding to fix potholes in North London. An important job, no doubt, but a blow for those who had hoped for better rail connections and stronger transport links for the North. To many, this reinforced the belief that London was getting all the big rail projects. Metro projects in cities like Edinburgh struggle for funding and were ultimately watered down or cancelled altogether. The simple reason this happens is because London is where the money is. Historically, it has been shown that as trains are built, demand and business naturally follow. But most investors want to invest in something which they can see right now, and it helps if this is right outside their office. This all helped to highlight the growing cracks in the franchise system. Supporters of privatisation continued to insist that quality of service and passenger numbers had gone up steadily and rapidly since privatisation. Opponents responded that this was largely due to the franchises being awarded government subsidies at levels British Rail could only have dreamed of, and that if the latter had had this kind of funding they would have been world leading. Supporters responded that the subsidy per journey has gone down, hovering at around £2 per journey, compared to more than 3 under British Rail. Opponents responded that this is offset by a rise in fares, operating companies having been given very little regulation in this regard and the average fares have risen by almost 30% compared to the equivalent fares in 1995. For some journeys, mainly standard single classes, the rise has been more than 200%, though fares for advanced tickets in off-peak hours have gone down. 
Nonetheless, the franchise system has left Britain in the unenviable position of having the highest fares in Europe and the highest level of government spending in Europe. And because most of the companies are registered abroad, much of the funding is being funnelled out of the country. And despite this, Britain's railways have no clear advantage in performance over their European counterparts. The system assigned services to a franchise based on which promised the most. This gave franchises a motive to overpromise whether or not they could deliver. In 2018, the East Coast Mainline service went into administration for the second time in a decade, Virgin Rail having produced a loss, despite promising a four billion return within two years. For the first time since privatisation, a major service was placed under a permanent public ownership, with LNER created to manage services on the East Coast. LNER were much more successful, able to organise faster, more frequent and more profitable services between London and Edinburgh. Class 801 Azuma trains were introduced, providing a sleeker and more efficient service. Suggestions were raised that other failing franchises could be handled in a similar way to LNER, creating a new British rail bit by bit, with little additional cost. But these suggestions fell on deaf ears. However, circumstances would soon force through changes. In 2020, COVID-19 swept the world. After some initial reluctance, Britain was placed into lockdown, with all non-essential businesses told to either work remotely or to put their staff on furlough, and the public instructed not to leave the house unless absolutely necessary. Passenger numbers naturally plummeted to a fraction of pre-pandemic levels. Despite this, the railways could neither halt nor reduce their services, due to the need to cater to key workers. Masks were made compulsory on services, a restriction which would stay in place longer than most places with similar mandates. Even as lockdowns were eased, the public were hesitant about travelling in a confined space with hundreds of strangers, and it would take time for passenger numbers to fully recover. This was disastrous for the franchises. The government entered into emergency recovery measures agreements. Normal passenger service mechanisms were amended, transferring almost all revenue and cost risk to the government effectively renationalising these services temporarily. In an effort to balance the books, the DNT proposed sweeping changes. They would introduce more driver-only trains and cut back jobs in many areas, which would put almost 2,000 people out of work and compromise safety standards. They would also increase working hours with no overtime pay. Furthermore, they would shut many ticket offices. This did not sit well with rail workers, who were already upset with repeated pay freezes especially when shareholders had continued to award themselves significant pay rises throughout the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. To protest these changes and campaign for fairer contracts, the RMT, ASLEV and the TSSA voted to implement the first nationwide rail strike since privatisation, a series of temporary strikes which would block the proposed changes from being implemented and generally force those in power to listen. The strikes served as a rallying cry for many other public sector workers who felt they were similarly underpaid and overworked, particularly after having been on the front lines throughout the pandemic. Strikes soon broke out in many sectors. Opponents of the rail strikes insisted that rail workers were already being paid significantly more than a good proportion of the British public, and asked them to consider the impact these strikes would have on many businesses who were trying to recover from the pandemic not to mention the railways themselves who were trying to win back passengers they'd lost to the roads. Supporters responded that driver pay was a side issue, working conditions and job security were the main problem. Though the disruption caused was regrettable, they had no choice but to call the strikes when they did, to prevent the changes they were protesting against being rushed through. They also claimed the deals they were being offered were repeatedly changed at the last minute to include the driver-only trains, something they were not willing to budge on. Meanwhile, the DMD were equally unwilling to concede, and so the dispute dragged on. This led many to accuse the government of repeatedly blocking negotiations. After all, in Scotland and Wales, where the DMT has no power, deals were reached quite quickly. YouGov surveys showed a 57% union support from the public, a figure which remained fairly constant throughout the strikes. Nonetheless, the government passed new legislation, giving operators a right to demand 40% service during strikes. So far, the operators are yet to exercise this right. Shortly after this legislation was passed, 
a deal was finally offered which was accepted by the RMT, one which granted them a pay rise of up to £15,000 annually and a four-day working week with no job losses. But although this deal was accepted by them, no deal has yet been reached with Aslev at the time of making this video. The other major impact of the pandemic was to make the franchising system unsustainable. Up until this point, if a franchise went into administration, the public-owned operator of last resort would manage services there until the franchise could be sold on. But it was becoming increasingly difficult to find a private company that could handle the responsibility. But now the system was changed so that the OLR would maintain the service permanently. At the current time, seven major franchises are under the OLR's control, effectively nationalising a significant chunk of the network. In 2022, it was announced that the franchise system would be formally abolished. The public-owned Great British Railways would be created to oversee the railways. Instead of a franchise contract, it would operate as a concessions contract, with operators paid a flat fee to operate services instead of keeping all the profits. It is argued that this new system will restore the central authority previously enjoyed by British Rail and simplify operations across the country. Others have argued that this system does not solve the inherent problem of operators run by shareholders who will make money regardless of the quality of service they provide. It is currently unclear what powers GBR will operate with. For instance, despite initial promises, the current stance is that the operators will continue to have the power to set their own fees, thus doing little to ease the skyrocketing fare costs. The announcement of Great British Railways was soon followed by a period of political instability, with several new prime ministers and one new king in the space of two years. GBR was pushed down in the priority rankings and it is currently unclear when and even if it will be put before Parliament. However, with a general election coming up and a lot of cross-party support for some form of nationalisation, it seems likely that it will happen eventually. When it does, it will likely usher in the next major phase of Britain's railway history. Perhaps this channel will return in 10 years' time to cover the new golden age of rail travel. Perhaps it will cover the rail's complete collapse. Perhaps everything will trundle along as before. This is a story for next time. Thank you all for following this series. I hope it has been as enjoyable to watch as it has been to make. This is not my last railway video. I do intend to return for one-off specials in between making episodes of my new series. So please like, share and subscribe if you would like to see more. There was a trailer for my new series in the description, so please watch that. And in the meantime, why not check out the rest of the series if you've not already done so. I hope to see you soon.